first spell out my background of uh, where I've been around the idea of energy and then try and distill what I've learnt over the 50 years or so that I've been doing it into the next 20 minutes or so. Uh, in 1968, I was a bright-eyed young physicist, uh, having spent seven years at the University of New South Wales collecting enough cornflakes tops for a science degree and having done a full-time honours year and done a few odd things like teaching school science while I figured out what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I decided to go to the UK and do doctoral research in physics and my research was funded by the UK Atomic Energy Authority uh, through the group who were working on the prototype fast breeder reactor at Doon Ray in the north of Scotland. And having grown up in this state and regularly reading about people being killed and injured in coal mines and seeing the pollution of air and water from burning coal, I was quite attracted to the idea of a technically cleaner way of producing the energy we needed than burning coal. My first academic job was at the UK Open University and I'm probably one of the few people on the earth who can say that their professional development was improved by Margaret Thatcher. Um, I was employed by the Open University which had been set up by the Wilson Labor government. They lost the 1970 election and uh, the Heath Conservative government took over with Margaret Thatcher as the Minister for Education. And she thought the idea of an open university teaching people at a distance, university of a second chance, was some sort of socialist nonsense. And she couldn't stop the university operating because we'd already taken in 25,000 students. But she could slow down the capital program. So the university had no laboratories. We were working in building site huts in a muddy field. And because we were interested in research, a group of five of us formed an energy research group to do pencil and paper research looking at energy issues uh, just a few months before the Organisation of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, uh, brought on what became known in the Northern Hemisphere as the energy crisis. Uh, OPEC became upset that they were only getting something like $1.80 US a barrel for oil and the governments of nations that were using oil uh, were actually getting more per barrel of oil than the nations who produced it. And they were demanding what was thought to be unreasonable of $5 a barrel for oil. The importing countries said they weren't prepared to pay that, so they turned off the tap. And uh, garages literally ran out of fuel. There were fist fights at the Bowser over the last few drops in uh, the UK. In the more robust culture of the USA, there were gunfights at the petrol pump. And, uh, the Northern Hemisphere nations really realised that they were over a barrel, so to speak, that uh, they really needed oil and they were prepared to stump up and pay $5 a barrel. Um, what happened then was that that increase in the price of oil flowed through into the price of everything, which is a reflection that em energy is not just something we use when we turn a light switch or put fuel in a vehicle. Energy flows into all of the goods and services. And I'll come back to that, that point in a moment. Um, when I came back to Australia, I was on the National Energy Research Council for five years, and we funded the research at the University of New South Wales, which uh, uh, the colleague to my right will talk to you about. Um, and uh, uh, I've stayed involved in energy issues uh, ever since. I spent a year running the Commission for the Future in the days when we thought that we had a future and we should think about it rather than hoping that it would be delivered to us through the magic of the market. And uh, more recently, when the South Australian state government decided to have a royal commission into the nuclear industry, uh, I was the token rat bag on their expert advisory committee. Uh, the other members of the advisory committee were to a man, and I used the gender-specific word advisably, uh, all hot keen on us having nuclear power stations and taking in the world's nuclear waste and I was there as the, the token critic. So I've been around the energy industry in one form or another uh, since the late 1960s and I think what I've learned over that time is that energy is the fundamental reason why we live more comfortably than any previous generation has ever lived and why we live more comfortably than about 90% of people in the world today. Because energy enables us to do things that previous generations could not do, 
like travel long distances or process huge amounts of data. And it makes things that previously required hard physical effort, from washing clothes to constructing buildings or repairing roads, to be done much more easily. And if you add up uh, all of the uses of energy, it's much more than most people realise. If you add up the total amount of energy used in Australia and divide it by the number of people, we are all using energy at the rate of about six kilowatts. Now, six kilowatts is a lot of energy. That's six one bar radiators. It's more than the peak demand of a standard house. It's the energy of a small vehicle traveling at about 50 kilometers an hour or a chariot and four horses at a full gallop. And of course, none of you are conscious of using energy at that rate as you sit quietly trying to stay awake through this boring talk. <laughs> um, and it doesn't mean that there are people in Melbourne huddled over 10 or 12 radiators to make up for you slackers in the Northern Rivers who aren't doing your share. It, the reflection of the fact that energy is an input to everything we do. Our buildings, our food, our water supply, our waste management, everything we do it requires inputs of fuel energy. And uh, the one uh, figure that illustrates that is that there's an almost perfect correlation between the world price of oil and the average price of a basket of foods. Because every time the oil price goes up, the petroleum needs of tilling the land, harvesting the crops, processing them into food, transporting and distributing, goes up linearly in relation to the price of oil. Uh, and there's a, a fair argument that the, uh, the Arab Spring, the riots of the Arab Spring, were a reflection of the fact that increasing prices of oil meant people couldn't put food on the table. And people put, will put up with a lot under a dictatorship, but if they can't put food on the table, they're prepared to go into the street and face the dictator's guns to try and get something done about it. Now, we live more comfortably because we use a lot of energy and historically the most plentiful and uh, cheapest forms of energy have been the abundant fossil fuels, coal and oil and gas. Uh, some of us have known for more than 30 years that the burning of coal and oil and gas is changing the global climate. Uh, I thought that was clear in 1989 when I wrote a paperback book called Living in the Greenhouse. Uh, having spent a period of time in 1988 working with CSIRO to communicate what the science was saying about climate change. At that point, the science was clear that human activity was changing the composition of the atmosphere. A measuring station at Mauna Loa in Hawaii was set up as part of the International Geophysical Year in 1957. So by the mid-1980s, there was 30 years of data showing the amount of carbon dioxide in the air fluctuated seasonally and was going steadily up. And the amount of other so-called greenhouse gases like methane and oxides of nitrogen were also going up. And by 1985, it was also clear that the climate was changing. It was getting on average warmer. There were more very hot days, fewer very cold nights, rainfall patterns were changing and so on. But cautious scientists were saying it was too early to say that the changes to the atmosphere were, changing, were causing the changes to climate. And that was why the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was set up to assess the science. By 1995, the science was in. It was clear that there was a human footprint, and every year since it's become more and more definite that human activity is changing the global climate. There are still a few people who have the intellectual skills to be elected to the parliament under the banner of the National Party, uh, who are holding the telescope to their blind eye and pretending they don't see any signal. But there's no serious argument in the scientific community and there hasn't been for nearly 30 years. And 30 years ago, when uh, the science was clear but global commerce was still saying nothing to see here, move on, at the Kyoto Conference in 1997, the one commercial sector that was saying climate change is an issue, we need to do something about it, was the insurance sector. And they were saying in 1997, we can read the red ink on our balance sheet. We can see that it's costing more each year in property damage. And they summed it up by saying in 1997, that discounting for inflation, what they paid out in the 1980s for property damage 
was more than the 1960s and the 1970s put together. And what they paid out in the first five years of the 1990s was more than all of the 1980s, which was more than the 60s and 70s put together. And they said, we are commercial organisations, we have to set premiums that reflect the risk of paying out. Um, it's getting harder and harder to increase our premiums to a level that's actuarially responsible. And they said in 1997, by 2020, people will be losing their houses and be uninsured because they will be unable to afford what the actuaries tell us is the responsible premium for property damage. And of course, that's exactly what we are now seeing. We are now seeing the consequences of climate change and uh, a recognition that we need to clean up our act. Cleaning up our act consists of two steps and the later two speakers are going to refine to a fine tilt the ground I'm about to break very superficially. The, the first is efficiency. Improving the efficiency of turning energy into the goods and services that we want. The American analyst Amory Lovins, who ran the Rocky Mountains Institute, said in 1975, people don't want energy, they want hot showers and cold beer. They want the services that energy provides. I've never heard anyone say, I've got to go and get some mega jewels. What people want is the ability to be comfortable, to see after dark, to cook their food, to wash their clothes, to move around. And much of the technology that we use to turn energy into the services we want is still appallingly inefficient. Three things to quantify that. 20 years ago, a report was handed to the Howard government, the National Framework for Energy Efficiency. It estimated, based on the technology that existed then, 20 years ago, that we could reduce our energy use and our emissions 30% using cost-effective existing technology that paid for itself in less than four years. Yesterday, in a session at the Brisbane Writers' Festival, I heard a scientist who's now on the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change group that produced the sixth assessment report released earlier this year, estimate that we could halve our energy use today using cost-effective existing technology. <laughs> we are one of the few developed countries that has no vehicle efficiency standards, uh, neither minimum standards for individual vehicles or fleet average standards, and as a result, the efficiency of our vehicle fleet has not improved in the last 50 years. The average fuel use per person kilometre is no better now than it was 50 years ago, because all of the improvements in the technologies of engines and tyres and gears, drive systems, has been swallowed up by our vehicles getting steadily larger and heavier and having more fuel using additions like air conditioning and power steering and power brakes and stereo and hot and cold folding swing doors, all of which use energy and make our vehicles less efficient. And we have no serious appliance efficiency standards after they got tired of the Commonwealth dragging their feet, the Labor governments in New South Wales and Victoria brought in efficiency labels for appliances. So that if you go to buy a new refrigerator, there's a label giving a number of stars and telling you the estimated uh, use. But we have no minimum standards. And the result is that appliances that could not legally be sold in Western Europe are dumped in Australia. And so, on average, our refrigerators use about twice as much electricity as they should if they were best practice. I was reminded of that when I was on Talkback Radio talking about efficiency, and uh, a man rang in whose refrigerator had died, and he shopped carefully around looking at the number of stars and the, uh, the, the rating of how much electricity it would use per year, and proudly bought the most efficient refrigerator that met his needs. He then searched on the web and found that it did not meet the minimum standards for Western Europe. That was the best he could buy in his showroom and could not legally be sold in Western Europe. In fact, many of the appliances on sale in Australia could not even be sold in the more progressive states of the USA, which hardly springs to mind as a paragon of energy efficiency. The failure to use modern efficiency standards costs you money, as well as costing the environment. If the refrigerator you use uh, takes twice as much electricity to keep the beer cold, you are paying for that, 
and the atmosphere is paying for that. So, uh, to, to, to sum up what needs to be done, I reviewed a report done for the UN called Resource Efficiency and Economic Outlook for the Asia-Pacific Region, and it concluded that to meet the legitimate material expectations of the people in our part of the world, including China and India and Southeast Asia, within the limits of natural systems, we need what they call a new industrial revolution, in which we meet our needs using a quarter of the resources per person that we now do. And they said that that's a legitimate stretch target, that you could easily quantify ways of reducing our uh, energy and resource needs uh, for the things we use uh, by a factor of four. Just to give one specific example, I used to speculate that if you gave a group of undergraduate engineering students a design task, design a transport vehicle to move around a fragile payload typically weighing between 50 and 100 kilograms. If they came back with a vehicle that weighed one and a half tonnes, you'd probably suggest they rethink their career aspirations, maybe move to somewhere where numeracy was not important, like economics or politics. Because if you think about it, we use 20 times as much energy moving the vehicle as moving the useful payload. It's, it's a ludicrously inefficient design because it evolved from the horseless carriage. It evolved when comfort was important, when energy was cheap, and the consequences of wasting it were undetectable. We've known now for decades that the consequences of wasting energy are not undetectable. They are seriously changing the global climate. But we still have large, inefficient vehicles that aren't suited to the task. So, first priority. Because there is no zero emissions technology, there is no totally environmentally benign way of producing energy, the most important priority and the most cost-effective response to climate change is to improve the efficiency of turning raw energy into the goods and services that we need. So what do we use energy for? We use it to modify our climate, to provide electricity for appliances, to allow us to move around, to allow us to manufacture things from raw materials like steel and aluminium, to sophisticated products like motor vehicles or TV sets or laptop computers, uh, to cook food and uh, to grow and process our, our food. They're all areas that, if we're serious about getting to zero emissions, and we should be, they're all areas that we need to clean up. I was heartened to see that the Commonwealth Government has just established a net zero authority uh, whose job is to prepare a roadmap. Because it's easy to say we'll be at net zero by 2050 because none of the people saying it will be alive in 2050 so they can't be held to account. But what we need is a real roadmap that shows how we get from where we are to where we want to be with uh, measurable targets for each step along the way so that we can hold their feet to the fire and say that this isn't good enough, we, we need to do better. In terms of electricity, historically, fossil fuels were the cheapest way to provide the electricity we use. And in the so-called national grid, which covers the eastern states, um, including Tasmania and South Australia, we still get about two-thirds of our electricity from coal. Uh, historically, that was cheap, and when I wrote Living in the Greenhouse, there was an obvious cost penalty to looking at the cleaner ways of providing uh, electricity, like solar and wind and, uh, to the less extent, hydro. That is no longer true. In 2010, average global prices for different forms of energy, gas-fired electricity, 8 cents a kilowatt hour, black coal, 11 cents a kilowatt hour, brown coal, 13 cents a kilowatt hour, wind, 14 cents a kilowatt hour, solar, 37 cents a kilowatt hour, oh, and cheap, clean nuclear power, 12 cents a kilowatt hour. By last year, world average prices, gas was still 8, black coal was still 11, Brown coal was still 13. Nuclear was now 16. Wind power, average price, 4.1 cents a kilowatt hour. Solar, 3.7 cents a kilowatt hour. And that's the average. The best price I saw was a new solar farm in Portugal, 1.1 cents a kilowatt hour. Now, to put it in perspective, if you buy electricity from the grid, you're paying about 15 cents a kilowatt hour. 
which is a bit more than the cost of coal, um, a bit less than the cost would be of nuclear power if we had any, but about four times the cost of solar and wind. So there is now no economic penalty of moving to the cleaner energy technologies of solar and wind. And the pattern of global investment reflects that economic change. 2021 is the last year for which I have all the figures. In 2021, the world invested 100, built 192 gigawatts, 1,000 megawatts, 192 gigawatts of new renewables, 109 gigawatts of wind, 65 gigawatts of solar, 18 gigawatts of hydro, 192 gigawatts. How much new coal? Well, actually, about minus five gigawatts. In other words, the amount of coal-fired power at the end of the year was less than at the start because the new coal-fired power still being built in China was less than the old coal-fired power decommissioned. Nuclear, five gigawatts of new nuclear, but three gigawatts of old nuclear was decommissioned, so a net increase of two. So world, about 200 gigawatts of new renewables, two gigawatts net of new nuclear, uh, minus five gigawatts of coal. It's clear the way the world's going. The world is voting with its wallets. And a recent report by a German uh, academic found that old coal and nuclear power stations in the Northern Hemisphere, which have long amortised their capital cost, are being closed down because just the running costs means that it's more expensive electricity than you can now get from solar farms and large wind turbines. There used to be a furphy that you couldn't scale wind and solar up to meet our needs. It's all right for a niche, maybe 10 or 20%, but the grid would be unstable if we were getting more than 20 or 30% of our electricity from renewables. The, the technical term for that argument is bullshit. <laughs> to elaborate on that, um, last year, South Australia got 70% of all its electricity from solar and wind. And there was a stretch of nearly two weeks in December when they got all of their electricity from solar and wind and were exporting their surplus to Victoria to replace the unreliable brown coal-fired power stations which tend to go belly up on hot summer days. So South Australia was not only totally dependent on solar and wind, 100%, no unstable grid, no problems, partly because they invested in a big battery and they were criticised by Josh Frydenberg as Turnbull's environment minister for wasting money on a big battery. The Labor government in South Australia was voted out and replaced by the Marshall Liberal government who built a bigger battery. Because you don't have to be an idiot to be a member of the Liberal Party. There are Liberal members who can read joined up writing and do takeaway sums and they could see that the big battery had paid for itself in about six months by improving the ability to use solar and wind when the sun wasn't shining and the wind wasn't blowing and to stabilise uh, the grid. And so they built an even bigger battery. And again, to reinforce the point, they didn't have to be an idiot to be a Liberal minister. When Mr Keane was your uh, energy minister in New South Wales, he set the goal of getting 90% of your electricity in New South Wales from solar and wind by 2030. Uh, the problem, of course, is storage. And um, there was a study done by three academics at the Australian National University, Ken Baldwin, uh, Andrew Blakers and Malcolm Stock, that looked at pumped hydro as an option for storage. Not big dams, because big dams do significant environmental problems, which is why some of us stood in the street objecting to the proposed Gordon Below Franklin Dam um, 40 years ago. Um, they, the pumped hydro consists of so-called turkey nest dams about the area of a football field by 20 or 30 metres deep, two dams separated by one or 200 metres in altitude. So when you've got surplus energy, you pump water uphill. Uh, when you need it, you allow it to run down and, and generate electricity. They identified about 15,000 possible sites around the eastern state grid for pumped hydro, of which you would need to use the best 50 to have enough storage to run Eastern Australia totally on solar and wind. And when Mr Keane was your minister, uh, he called commercial tenders for eight pumped hydro schemes in New South Wales to provide the storage that will allow you to get 90% uh, of your electricity from solar and wind. 
There are still people in the darkest recesses of the coalition saying we need an adult conversation about nuclear power. And my response has been to say, I'm very happy to have an adult conversation about nuclear power. Even if you're prepared to overlook the risk of accidents like Chernobyl or Fukushima, and I'm not sure you should be, and even if you're prepared to overlook the risk of fissile material being misused for weapons, and I'm not sure you should be, and even if you're prepared to overlook the fact that radioactive waste needs to be stored for geological time, which is not just a technical problem, but it's also a social problem because we need to design systems that will last far longer than any human civilization has ever endured and will ensure that future generations don't... Uh, as Victorians did when they discovered the pyramids, decide that if previous civilizations had built these big structures, there had to be something important inside them. We would need to design structures that would ensure that geological repositories for radioactive waste uh, weren't tapped into by, by future generations. Even if you're prepared to overlook all of those things, the cold hard fact is the most optimistic estimate of what you could get electricity from a nuclear power station for is about four times the price of electricity from solar farms and wind turbines. And um, it, it just doesn't make any economic sense. And the only three power stations being built in Western Europe are all years behind schedule and billions over budget. Um, and that's why the average price from nuclear is now 30% more than it was 10 years ago. Uh, we keep trying to prevent accidents like Fukushima from happening again, and each one of those means more complex engineering and more cost. Saul Griffiths, in the latest quarterly essay, which I commend to you, uh, argues that uh, all of the other areas of energy use, transport, manufacturing, cooking, heating, uh, the only way to get to net zero in those areas is to electrify them because gas inevitably produces carbon dioxide. And um, he argues persuasively that we should be using induction cooktops rather than gas, for example. Uh, we shouldn't be using gas for industrial processing. And, of course, that means we need about twice as much electricity as if um, we uh, continue to use uh, excuse me, petroleum fuels for transport and uh, uh, gas for cooking and heating and, and manufacturing. Um, if you look at the long-term future of transport, I think the two issues we need to consider are the scale of the task and which technologies we use. Transport planners tend to behave as if the transport pattern is fixed, it's been handed down from on high or imposed on us by Martians, and the job of transport planners is to meet the transport task as it now is. But there is nothing preordained about the transport task. Particularly in urban areas, it's largely a product of decisions that are made about urban planning or lack of urban planning. In their book, Cities and Automobile Dependence, Jeff Kenworthy, uh, sorry, Peter Newman and Jeff Kenworthy, compared two new cities that were built in the 1970s, Milton Keynes in the UK, where I lived when I was working for the Open University, and a Dutch city called Almere. Almere has twice as many dwellings per hectare as the British city. The consequence is that in the Dutch city, 85% of journeys are less than three kilometres. In the British city, about 40% of journeys are less than three kilometres. People are rational. If the things that they access every day, like their kids' school or the local shop, are within walking or cycling distance, people will walk or cycle. If we perversely put them out of reach, uh, people will drive. And sure enough, in the Dutch city, 35% of all journeys are by bicycle. In the British city, 5%. In the British city, 60% of journeys are in car, 25% in the Dutch city. So we really need to take seriously the idea of urban planning. The cities that work uh, are complex connections of urban villages. If you talk to people who live in London, they don't think they live in London. They think they live in Camden Town or they live in Bayswater, or they live in Battersea, and most of what they use every day is within walking distance, and they have good public transport to get to the other parts of the city. No city in the world has ever solved its transport problem by building more roads, and the idea of congestion busting is just loopy. 
all building more roads does is encourage more people to drive. And if you get to the extreme of Los Angeles, 50% of the downtown area is dedicated to the car and you have gridlock every morning and every night. It just doesn't work. So in planning for the future, we need better public transport in our cities and a survey just released by the Climate Council shows 70 or 80 per cent of Australians agree we should be investing more in public transport rather than bulldozing houses, widening roads, trying to enable people to drive from wherever they are to wherever they want to go. The second thing we need to do is improve facilities for so-called active transport, walking and cycling. And again, we think of the bicycle as a transport technology for young people until they can graduate to something more dangerous. But there are quite civilised cities in Western Europe where the majority of all urban trips are made by bicycle because the facilities are appropriate and the legal framework is appropriate. In the Netherlands, the big step was changing the law to bring in a parallel to the sailing maxim that steam gives way to sail because it's more powerful. Cars have to give way to bicycles. And if there's a collision between a car and a bicycle, the driver of the car is at fault because the car is more manoeuvrable and better able to avoid the collision. And that legal step made the, the roads safer for bicycles. I, I always felt I was risking my life riding my bicycle to Griffith University because a lot of drivers in Queensland clearly regarded it as an offence to have a bicycle on the road. And... Uh, they used to throw stuff at me and uh, try and run me off the road in my little bicycle. Um, we, we need to have our cities organised so that more people can walk and cycle and fewer people need to use a car. But for mechanised transport, I agree with Alan Finkel, who's in his quarterly essay, Getting to Zero, argued that we will use electric vehicles for small-scale local personal transport and for long-distance transport and heavy freight, we'll probably use hydrogen fuel cells. In general, if you're producing solar or wind electricity, it's better to use it as electricity than to throw some of it away using it to split water into hydrogen and oxygen and then use, lose more energy turning the hydrogen back into, into motive power. Um, but you, you can't have big enough batteries to run a large freight vehicle or an ocean... Uh, ocean-going transport, so that will probably have to be hydrogen fuel cells. And again, uh, 20 years ago, Perth was one of 11 cities around the world that participated in a trial of hydrogen fuel cell buses. I've ridden in the hydrogen fuel cell bus and I've talked to the driver. From the point of view of the driver or the punter, there's no way of detecting that you're being powered by hydrogen rather than diesel or gas. The only noticeable feature is that the bus was about 10 centimetres higher than a standard bus because you need the area of the bus by 10 centimetres high to store enough hydrogen to do a day's work. So it's entirely possible to see a future in which our transport needs are met from renewable energy, either stored in batteries uh, or uh, converting to hydrogen for the, the, the large power operations. Countries in the Northern Hemisphere have recognised that. If you work backwards, if you want to get to zero emissions by 2050 and the average life of a vehicle is 15 years, that means by 2035 you have to have stopped selling vehicles that rely on petroleum fuels. And a whole range of European cities now have dates, uh, the earliest is 2025, beyond which it will not be legal to sell petroleum fuel vehicles. Some have a two-stage approach. Um, you can sell petroleum or diesel vehicles to 2025 and hybrid ones by 2030, but after that it has to be electric vehicles. 90% of all sales in Norway last year were electric vehicles. The backward country of China, the majority of all new vehicles sold last year were electric vehicles. Again, we are behind the rest of the world in moving to, to cleaner transport. There are little things we can all do. We can all use fuel more efficiently but we need our leaders to make the structuring decisions. You can only use public transport if it's there. You will only use a bicycle if it's safe to do so. Uh, we need the structuring decisions to be made by our politicians. And I think the, the, the great sign of progress was when people last year, people who had never voted for anyone other than the major political parties, voted in Teal Independence, voted in Greens, and the only common platform those politicians had were action on climate change and greater integrity of government. So the community gets it, they want to see more action. 
they recognise that the basis of our comfortable lifestyle is energy, so doing nothing is not an option. We need to clean up our act, but it's entirely technically possible to power Australia totally on renewable energy. It would be defensible now to say that buildings that are predominantly occupied during the day, like schools, universities, shopping centres, office blocks, must have solar panels on the roof to provide their electricity. They would actually be getting cheaper electricity. You were doing them an economic favour by saying you must use solar energy that, rather than buying electricity from the grid for three or four times the price. So the most important thing I believe we can do as individuals, as citizens, as voters, is put our hot breath on the back of the politician's neck. Remind them that there is no longer any such thing as a safe seat. Remind them that people who have been in seats that had been liberal since time immemorial had been voted out because of inaction on climate change. Remind them that we want action, we want action now, and don't take no for an answer. Thank you very much. The commercial hydrogen fuel cells require you to use some form of electricity, ideally solar or wind, to uh, split water and hydrogen and oxygen, and that's something we all did in high school chemistry. That's, that's pretty basic. Pass an electric current through water, it splits into hydrogen and oxygen, and then uh, you feed the hydrogen into a fuel cell which turns it back into electricity. And the, the disadvantage is that there are two conversion steps and you, you, you lose energy at each step. Uh, so it's more sensible to use the electricity directly uh, to run a vehicle than to convert it to hydrogen and convert the hydrogen back into energy. Um, the, the only problem is that you, you can't uh, have a big enough battery to uh, r drive a freight truck from Perth to Sydney or a, uh, an iron ore vessel from the Pilbara to China. So uh, that is going to have to be run on, on hydrogen. Thank you. Um, so, yes, so actually this was my reminder to acknowledge uh, acknowledgement of country, so I acknowledge that we meet today on the unceded sovereign land of the Weadjibal Weabul people in the Bunjalung Nation and honour their elders past, present and emerging. Um, so these are my pictures from, 19, uh, from when I used to live back here, 1993-94, and I remember so much work when I lived up towards Tuntable and coming down to work in, in the valley here in the morning, the sun was up on the high mountains, but the, the valley was full of cloud and it was just absolutely beautiful. And this is a beautiful part of the country and, and thank you for keeping it this way. Next slide, please. Um, so these are some pictures of Peter Petals that we saw this morning at the presentation this morning. So just acknowledging the, the um, incredibly important role that Rainbow Power Company and the community in this area had in kick-starting the um, whole business of solar energy growth in Australia. This, the Rainbow Power Company was extremely important in this. It was a very much a pioneer and leader in, um, in introducing practical solar photovoltaics, practical micro hydro, solar thermal, and grid, small grid, off grid, sorry, off grid um, solar systems for commercial and home systems. Uh, next slide, please. So here's my uh, gaining credibility again. I won't do too much of this, but just a couple of slides. So this is our little house on the left here, which was just up on the hill behind Rainbow Power Company. Um, sorry, this way. Um, uh, it's gone now, I see. It's a big housing development of new houses, but that's the way it goes. Um, uh, I don't cry for it. It was a horrible, horrible cockroach-infested, terrible house, but anyway. <laughs> and, um, and this over, over here, I think if you just click... One more click, please. So in the little yellow circle, that's the Rainbow Cow Company there. And to the right of it, one more click, please. Yep, and that's that little house that we lived in. So, so um, that's established my local credibility, I hope. Thank you. Next slide, please. Um, that's the Rainbow Power Company again on the left. And this is what that area looks like now. So. Um, Anyway, that's no surprise for anybody who lives here. So next, please. 
Oh, sorry, that's here. Yeah, and we, we moved to a little bales at the back of somebody's place up on the way to Tuntable. And that's my baby and my wife. So that was us back then in, when we lived in Nimba before. Okay, let's move on to the techie stuff now. Oh, okay. Let's, oh, sorry, my cow. This is where this, in that bales, is where I edited my thesis when I got the, what, my PhD thesis, when I got the comments back from the reviewers. And that's the computer I did it at, and that's the cow that helped me do it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, please, next. And next. Okay, so the silicon solar cell can trace its roots back to the early 1940s at Bell Labs in the USA um, with very low efficiency, uh, but sort of almost semi-accidental discovery of, the, of how it can work. So having two, two zones accidentally at first, two zones of silicon with um, an excess of, of, impu of one impurity in one zone and an excess of a different impurity in two zones that give what we call a NP or PN junction, um, which was sort of discovered sort of accidentally, um, but we've turned that into, into very important things. Next, please. Next, next, please. Um, yes, yeah, so that ended up in a Nobel Prize for, for William Shockley. Next, please. Uh, in 1954, so first what we call efficient, so a few percent efficient silicon solar cells in 1954. Uh, also at Bell Labs. Next, please. So I'm going to go quite quickly through these. Um, that's the basis of technology. This is not wildly different from what we have now, but um, the edges, we wouldn't have the edges doped P-type these days. We'd just have, and the back, we'd probably have just the front um, in the simple structure that we use today. Next, please. So, got a lot of this history stuff, so I want to move through it quite quickly. Um, so, back in those days, even then, people were dreaming about powering the world with it. Um, the first markets tended to be not on Earth. Next slide, please. Not on Earth, but in space because um, there's much less competition for how you're going to supply electricity in space. Um, but people were dreaming about what this could do. Um, it's, those dreams are starting to come true, but they've been around for a long time and they've been a long time in gestation. Next slide, please. So, as I said on the right there, satellites were the, the initial big market. They paid the way, they could pay whatever it cost um, to generate electricity in such a remote place. And then we moved on to the more remote places on Earth were the next place where, where it could justify an expensive electricity source. Next, please. So this is um, quick and I'm going to, this just looks at the efficiency of the silicon solar cell as it proceeded through, um, through a few decades of development. From those original um, very low, low um, performance devices at Bell Labs in the 1950s um, through to a rapid increase in performance, mainly done in the USA, all at Bell Labs, um, then uh, a few other US performers. And Australia came into it where we see the, the red dot start there. And that's after, um, after Martin Green came to UNSW and um, got started, started a long series of excellence in generating this. So, so the, all of those dot points on that graph, next slide please, or next, push the button please, um, and keep going please. All of those are um, improvements along the way that, um, that set the bar a bit higher for the next people and gave another challenge to all the other laboratories working on it in competition. Um, next please. Uh, next please. Um, so these are technologies, so this technology became the, the dominant technology, we call the aluminium back surface field technology, uh, with a layer of aluminium on the back of the cell and, um, and a grid on the front of the cell, which was made by screen printing, so the, the uh, diagram up at the top right there is just showing the idea of screen printing, it's just like printing onto a t-shirt with ink, but we printed the metal um, as a liquid or as a a uh, gel, a uh, liquid for these lines, was printed um, in the same way through a screen printing process and then fired in the furnace to make a, 
a silver metal line that bonded very well to the silicon. Uh, that was uh, the major technology, the dominant technology for a long time. Next, please. So all these little cells, and if you go down to the Rainbow Power Company, you'll see uh, an old module that looks like this, two-inch diameter solar cells um, that used to be the, um, yeah, the core of our industry. Now these, they're much bigger. The wafers are much bigger now. Thank you. Next, please. Um, so that's Martin Green as a young man. He was my boss. He was my PhD supervisor. He's, um, he's still my boss. And um, so he did his master's, uh, he did his PhD degree at McMaster University in Canada and then came back as a young postdoc to start at UNSW in the mid-1970s and um, brought lots of ideas about um, uh, making, making solar power cheaper. Um, and this was at that time that, that Ian mentioned about, um, about uh, when, when fuel prices were high, uh, diesel, uh, diesel petroleum prices were very high. So there was lots and lots of interest in what are we going to do if we're not going to use petroleum for everything. Next, please. Um, so this was a group that, uh, including Martin there in the middle, um, who's, who got the record for the first 18% solar cell. Next, please. First 19% solar cell at the same lab. Next, please. Next, next please. Um, uh, we skipped one for the 20%, but that was at UNSW as well. Um, this one was a Stanford University one, which sort of spoilt our record for a while and irritated us a great deal because that wasn't the UNSW win. But um, you can see from the red dots up there on, on the right-hand side that we got it back. Next, please. Next, please. Um, so, in short, there's a long series of relatively minor improvements to the architecture and the way of making the solar cell um, of it, uh, always at every stage looking at what is it that's limiting the performance. Is it the front surface, the back surface, is it the edges, is it the quality of the material? So any of those could have been the limiting factor and that's what we need to address next. So it's no point, if it's not the limiting factor, there's no point in working on that at the moment. You need to find out what it is that's causing, causing, the, um, causing the major losses. So a whole series of technologies here. So now, the technology that was developed at UNSW was, is the PERC cell, the one at the top right there. That is what's 95% of the production of solar cells in the world is PERC technology. Um, there's, I think, this probably won't go on forever. So there's two challenging technologies at the moment, particularly called Topcon, Topcon um, which we see there, and um, interdigitated backfield, uh, so interdigitated back contact technology. So this one is very different in that it doesn't have any metal on the front, which stops the light from getting in. So that's obviously a good idea. It has both the positive and negative contacts on the rear. All good ideas as long as we can make it cheaply enough. Um, so one of those will probably be the next. Uh, the next champion that will be the next dominant technology. Next, please. And not Stanford now, but um, um, yeah, there's labs all over the world. Though, and a lot of this is happening in companies rather than in universities now because there's money to be made out of it. Thank goodness. Um, could you click on the YouTube one. So this is just going to. Oh, so if uh, sorry, I think there's another window, another window open like with the YouTube. No. Okay, maybe we can skip. We can skip that one. Anyway, that's that. That's I've taken that from the Australian Photovoltaics Institute webpage, and that is um, that's a little animation of the growth of solar energy in Australia showing what parts of Australia it's been growing in very dramatically and also showing um, the total. Okay, um, it's, yeah, it's probably not going to happen now. But um, let's, let's just stay on here because I want to... 
want to make sure that Sebastian's got some time to tell you about the equally important issue of, of energy efficiency. About the growth, the growth of the application of solar energy in Australia. Um, no. <laughs> Uh, uh, we, we set up another window earlier with with it ready to go, but uh, I think it was a different different person. <laughs> so, um, never mind, never mind. Let's move on. Um, so what they would have shown was a dramatic rise over time, by years from I think it was from 2007, the amount of solar installations in Australia, and a dramatic increase. Anyway, I think there's no surprises for anybody in the room anyway. It's a, it's a nice presentation of it. If you get a chance, go and have a look at it on the Australian Photovoltaics Institute website. Um, so this, this slide has a few graphs, three graphs that were taken from, um, from a presentation by Andrew Blakers in Renew Economy and the conversation just very recently, in, um, just a few days ago. So, um, um, so first one on the top left, looking at the global transition from fossil fuels to renewables and just looking at what are people actually building and, and um, Ian already talked to this um, but this is putting some more numbers around it. Um, so what are people actually building? What's actually being installed is not nuclear, it's not coal, it's not gas. It's wind and particularly solar. So this is what's actually been installed um, in the last few years. And you can see with the solar, not only is it bigger than everything else, but it's actually growing year by year and getting even further ahead. This is the champion. Country by country, um, how much electricity is being generated by wind and solar. Um, and this is for 2022, and Australia is right up there. And you'll notice that the yellow bar there is the highest of any country. So Australia's per capita use, per capita use of solar energy exceeds that of any other country. Um, and it's, that's part of it. Yeah, solar energy in general. Um, and solar and wind together, we're in that list, we're, we're ranked fourth in the world. So we're serious players in solar energy. We're doing well. We all need to do better, but we're doing pretty well. Um, next click, please. Um, so this is just looking at how we're, the total, total install capacity has been growing over years and exceeding the install capacity of nuclear back there in about 2017 that of hydro, that of gas, that of coal, that already now exceeding coal and gas and hydro and nuclear added together. This is, the world is really changing. Next, please. Um, this, this is what we call the learning curve or experience curve. And it looks at the price of, or the cost of something in this case, the cost of making solar photovoltaics, so it's price rather than cost, um, on, on this axis. And on this axis, it's not by year, but it's by the amount that has been made. So how much experience does the industry have at doing it? And it ends up being a very interesting on a log-log curve, because we can get pretty well a straight line for long sections of it. And so it looks at the price decline, and that's very helpful in um, estimating what might happen in the future. If this has happened um, reliably in the past, it will happen in the future. But there is, there is an issue with that, and I'll come back to that later. So well, I'll come back to that now, actually. <laughs> so the issue is that for silicon or any other solar cell that's made out of a single semiconductor material, any semiconductor material, there's a limit somewhere around 29, 30, 31% depending on the assumptions that you put into the calculation, for its ultimate efficiency. Silicon solar cells are now being, um, being made with over 26% efficiency. So we're getting very close to the ceiling in this. 
getting closer to the ceiling gets harder and harder. More and more effort needs to go into that. And to make a um, commercially realistic device to get closer to that ceiling gets harder and harder. So we're sort of running out of headroom there with silicon. What we'd like to do is to add on to the existing excellence that we have with silicon solar cells, um, not replace it with something else. There's no contenders for doing that anywhere. Um, but to add on to it with a second or maybe a second and a third layer that access different parts of the solar spectrum. So the idea here is that we would have silicon bottom cell, probably in the first instance one more layer, not two, as we've shown here. This, one's separ this top one accesses the blue-violet end of the rainbow. So it's nice here in rainbow country. We can talk about it this way. Um, whereas this one, the longer wavelength light at the red end of the rainbow comes through that, comes, it's transparent for that, comes through to the bottom cell. And we can combine the electrical outputs of this cell and this cell and get a higher performance. So we can get beyond that 29, 30% limit in this way. Our problem is what are we going to use for this other material? And this needs to be stable, it needs to be low cost, it needs to be able to make a good solar cell, um, it needs to be abundant, it needs to be non-toxic. So it's got lots of parameters that we need to meet with it. And it's been very hard. To be honest, we don't have a clear answer to that. Um, we have good answers except for one or two. So if you leave out stability, we have a good answer. If we leave out cost, we have a good answer. But we don't have a good answer for everything at the moment. We're still looking. We're working hard on that. Um, next, please. Uh, yeah, next, please. Uh, so this is just saying what I just said. Next, please. So our centre, this Australian Centre for Advanced Photovoltaics, is just finishing 10 years of funding from the Australian Renewable Energy Agency um, in Canberra. And we're starting another eight-year extension. So we're calling it ACAP2. And, and this is what we've used to, to demonstrate, to summarise what we're going to be working on. Now, I'm not going to go through all those things. But I've talked about some of these already. Silicon solar cells we're going to continue to work on. We can still squeeze a bit more out of them, bringing price down and performance up. Um, looking at other materials that might be the tandem, the top layers on those two stack devices that I mentioned. P specifically working on the tandem devices, the two stack devices or three stack devices. Um, looking at the losses that we have when we take solar cells and put them into solar modules or solar panels. Um, so we have some losses there. The performance of the panel is always lower than the performance of the cell. I want to close that gap. Um, and looking at end of life manufacturing sustainability as well, a whole suite of ideas there. Uh, next, please. So I'm just going to uh, speak very quickly because it came up in the conversation this morning at the uh, Rainbow Power Company discussion about end of life and what happens to them at end of life and the sustainability issues with that. Very legitimate questions. Um, so there is a growing, going to be a growing amount of photovoltaic waste. Um, this is unavoidable. It's, it will come to end of life. Next, please. Um, so, oh, sorry, could go back. Please, sorry. For, sorry. Uh, never mind. Uh, it's okay. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, I want to contrast the two, the numbers in yellow, highlighted in yellow. So we're expecting, and this is from a report from uh, University of Technology Sydney, um, my, my good friend Nick Florin was involved in that, a few thousands of tonnes per year by 2035 is the projection of the waste stream from photovoltaics in Australia. I just wanted to contrast that before we go on, and we, we need to deal with that. We, we, we should be responsible about that, we should own that, and we should think about what's going to happen with that. Um, but you've probably seen stories in the media about tsunamis of wastes, and, and we're going to be awash with 
dead photovoltaic modules, it sort of doesn't quite ring true. The concern doesn't quite ring true when at the same time we're not hearing about the 12.5 megatons of waste per year that's coming just as ash from coal-fired power stations. Where is the indignation and screaming about that? I don't hear it. So, so, <laughs> so yeah, well, there is, there is some, but it's um, not in the mainstream press, man. Um, but I do hear in the mainstream press a lot of concern about, about the photovoltaic waste. So that doesn't say we shouldn't deal with the photovoltaic waste. We should. So let's move on, please. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe let's see what, what, I, what I leave out and we can come back to that, yeah. Um, so, yeah, sorry, this is just saying what I just said about the coal ash. So let's just skip through all, there's a couple of, yeah, skip through these pictures of coal ash and get, get to the next one. Thank you. So, toxicity. Um, so, with silicon solar modules, silicon solar cells, there's pretty well nothing toxic in the cells. In the modules, that's not quite true, but it's almost true. So what makes it not true, um, or sorry, what toxicity there is, is in lead. And it's a lead solder that's used to interconnect the cells together through tapping. Um, so that's primarily, normally, it's um, solder is an um, alloy of tin and lead. So lead is a toxicity problem. It's really the only toxicity problem in silicon photovoltaic modules. So when you hear things like we've got on the right-hand side up here and on the bottom left here about the cadmium, the copper indium diselenide, the, none of these things are in silicon solar modules. None of those. They have been solar cells made of other materials other than silicon. For example, copper indium gallium diselenide, which is not particularly nasty, but anyway. Um, the cadmium telluride, you can make solar cells from them, but those materials are not in silicon solar modules, which is 95% of the production. So these concerns are a little bit confused. Um, so it's not that these things don't exist, Things like silicon tetrachloride is involved in the production of the silicon that we make the solar cells from, but it's not in the environment. It's, unless there's an accident, it's not getting out. It's too expensive to be allowed to get out. <laughs> it's, um, um, so it's, th there's some confected concern, I think, as well as some real concern. Um, but the I think we need to be careful about what the product is that we're attaching the toxicity issues to, and that hasn't always been carefully done. Next, please. So why aren't we just easily recycling solar modules? Why, why don't we do it? Very Well, it's not that we're not doing it, but we're not doing it as well as I'd like, to be honest. Um, and so I can just talk very quickly about um, about how a module is made. So up here on the top right-hand side, it should start on the left, but I'll start on the right. Um, we have solar cells that are interconnected with copper strip, uh, usually tin copper strip with lead solar, usually. Um, the very fine lines you can see there uh, running up diagonally are primarily made of silver. The strips are made of copper. They're soldered onto the silver lines. Um, Come over here on the left, we, or on the bottom right here, we interconnect those cells together. We put it in between a layer of encapsulant, a layer of encapsulant, a back sheet, and a front glass. And, and we end up with this stack. Here we put an aluminium frame around the tempered glass, and we put a junction box on the back. There's our solar module finished. The problem with pulling it all apart is because we've worked very, very hard to make sure it stays stuck together. <laughs> so we want this to sit out in the wind and rain and snow for, um, for decades and keep working at at least 80% of its performance over 25 or 30 year lifetime. 
to do that, we have to make sure that we exclude moisture and oxygen from the interconnections primarily, otherwise they'll be corroded. Uh, to do that, we take this encapsulant, which is, goes in as a, um, a plastic sheet, and we melt it under vacuum, uh, laminate it, just like laminating paper, um, uh, paper and plastic. Um, the, that plastic sheet melts and oozes into all the little gaps, so there's nowhere for air to go. And that's a big part of getting that long life. When we do that, that polymer cross-links. So the chains of polymer, polymer chains cross-link to each other, it means we can't, just we can't just melt it again. It's sort of fixed like that for a long time. So getting the silicon back again means we've got to get it unstuck from that. Getting the back sheet off means we've got to get it unstuck. Getting the glass back means we've got to get it unstuck. And to keep everything clean and pure because the value of the silicon we get back and indeed the value of the glass that we get back depends very much on how clean it is and how contaminated it gets. So when we, if we look at just chopping all this up and mincing it up and then trying to extract everything else, of course everything's cross-contaminated. Next please. Uh, that said about the same thing I just said, let's move on please. So I'm just going to finish with... Um, with just referring back to how I started with Rainbow Power Company. And one thing that Rainbow Power Company was doing then and is still doing now, um, but perhaps in different places, was working in developing countries with very small solar power systems. So the, small, the power systems that were going in here, this area when I was here, the simplest ones at least, were um, DC systems, a battery, a PV module, a charge controller and DC lights and DC, no, no inverter, DC lights and if you're doing it these days, it wasn't then, you'd be phone charger as well. I'm still doing that with my students in a, one, one of the islands, uh, Tanner Island in Vanuatu and these people, um, these people are sort of haven't been able to move on past that stage yet because the opportunities just haven't been there before for them. So these are working in uh, little medical clinics like this one where those two little second-hand modules from Australia um, were able to deliver lighting that they just didn't have. So when the next baby was born in that place, there was a light at night. So um, it makes a big, big difference to the, to the quality of life of those people. So... Um, there's still a lot of the world that is at this stage of development. And our industry that talked a lot about this back in the 80s and 90s, about the billions of people who don't have electricity, we sort of forgot them a little bit when, we, when grid connected electricity became a thing. And um, so we, we need to remember the work that's being done in this area on, on um, off-grid systems remains important. Next, please. I think it might be the end. Uh, next, next please. Um, so that's just an example of a water pumping system that we did. So uh, next please, and it's probably the end. I'm just rushing to give, to give the next speaker a bit of opportunity. Um, so that's out of order. So um, that's going back to the recycling, but I've put it out of order. So um, I think I'll say thank you very much. That's my final slide. Thank you very much. Acknowledge our funding agency, the Australian Renewable Energy Agency. Um, and this is that photo is a picture from back in 1973, I think, um, of the original people who were coming here. And we owe so much to them, to you. Thank you. All right. So, um Sort of linking back to Ian's talk um, in the realms of energy efficiency, I see myself as working pretty much on the front line um, on the, in terms of consulting to households. That's my work. Con I call myself an energy consultant, but really, realistically, um, it's an energy advisor. Consulting is something you do with corporations. Um, so... Yeah, it's my, the pri my primary role I see is, is helping households through the, 
the dis the decision overwhelm uh, and the uh, the analytical um, nuances of working out what you can do to make your home more energy efficient, meaning consuming only as much energy as you need to do the things you want to do. So if you want to have the cold beer or, um, you know, the barbecue on the weekend, that nothing's holding you back, but you're using as little energy as possible in the process. Um, and I think a lot of the reasons why my small business struggles is a lot of people are afraid, especially I think down Byron Way where I live, they're afraid that I'm going to tell them they have to reduce their lifestyle or live with less, um, uh, restrain their, their consumeristic ways. And so I think people are quite reticent to get someone, uh, an expert in to consult and tell them what they need to do. Um, but in reality, a uh, little bit like the the message of uh, in Sol Griffith's um, book, The Big Switch, and also the quarterly essay that Ian referred to, um, the message more these days is you can do everything that you were doing before, uh, but you can do it more efficiently with less energy and less fossil fuel energy, more importantly. Um, I'm still... I still like to live simply and use less energy, so I'm still prone to to um, uh, changing the temperature of the air conditioner or turning off lights. Um, I think it's inbuilt in my nature, which leads me to this slide. Um, I grew up on a commune near Yukai. Um, my step I just checked in with him today to confirm, but I, it was um, my, my stepfather. I will stay on that first slide. Thanks. Um, my stepfather, who um, it was inspired to move up to the Northern Rivers, he didn't get to come to the Aquarius Festival, but um, it was the main inspiration for, for us moving up here. And he was telling me that the year after Aquarius, so 74, he, um, he uh, hitched up and, and, and stayed at Tuntable for quite a while. And... And so we moved up here in 75 and um, moved on to a very small MO called Gumboot Gully near Yukai. Yeah, if we can go... Yeah, there's a back arrow very far left of the corner of the screen or there would be a page or maybe a page up button on the keyboard. <clears throat> anyway, I'll keep talking. Um, we moved up here in 75 and they built a beautiful house. Sadly, it was never finished and I went back to visit it about 10 years ago and it still hasn't been finished. Um, and I think some of you can relate to, to that. It it's, can be hard to find the resources, especially if you're trying to live very minimalistically. You need to, to get the money in to, to finish your home. Um, so... Oh, that's nearly there. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so this is the house. Um, I still, it was such a beautiful house. And this whole, we can see the blue uh, polycarbonate, I imagine it was, or similar. That whole wall, there was no wall there. So it was just this open deck leading out into the, into the treetops. Um, and that was my bed. That's me in the window. That was my bedroom. Didn't get around to putting the windows in. <laughs> There's no front door. I had one window on the side here, but not on there. Um, so you can imagine it was very cold in winter. <laughs> um, and my parents were sleeping up in the loft, so I was down here by myself and I'd hear the koalas mating and I was just very, very scared. Um, <laughs> five years old, just moved from the city. But I actually attribute living on this, this wave in a very pivotal part of my childhood, I actually have been reflecting recently that it's one of the reasons I'm so heightened, have such a heightened awareness of energy use and I don't take it for granted. Um, these are pre-solar days, we didn't have any solar, uh, so it was, it was kerosene lanterns. Um, I think they had a gas, little gas fridge, otherwise wood stove, so living very simply and, and that was my baseline. And everything since then um, 
is, seems like an extravagance. <laughs> yeah. um, nonetheless, my the lead from there is that the majority of Australian households use a lot of energy. And I think the majority of you here wouldn't fall into this category. Um, but in order to make a bigger impact on our um, greenhouse gas situation globally, um, I've devoted myself to trying to help the av more average household um, reduce their consumption um, through efficiency or behaviour, technology, wh whatever means and whatever they um, have the capacity to, to uh, apply themselves to. So, um, yeah, the average Australian household consumes 11 tonnes of, carbon of greenhouse gas emissions per year. Um, and a, a fair, a, quite a big portion of that is transport, so vehicles. So that includes um, petrol and diesel. Uh, but just taking electricity alone, it's more around the five or six tonnes mark. So that represents a very big opportunity to make a difference to our, our total carbon emissions. H household um, electricity is overall only about 12% of Australia's total greenhouse emissions. And some people would say, well, why should we do anything? Um, it's only 12%, you know, it's the big industry that needs to make the changes. And yes, it is, and the politicians need to be at the forefront of that. But I, I'm really drawn towards household efficiency because it's something tangible that um, is very close to home, excuse the pun, and it's something that we all have the capacity to do something about. Um, and that's, that was the start of my journey as well. Well, this was the very start, but I bought a house down on the coast about 20 years ago and didn't realise at the time just how poorly designed it was. No um, consideration for passive solar design or, or anything, or insulation or anything along those lines. And I've spent the last 10 years in trying to improve that house through retrofitting. And that's, so that's... The, the, my specialty now is helping people retrofit their houses. Um, and I'm also studying to be a thermal performance assessor for new builds because clearly we want new houses to be built uh, efficiently in the first place. And so fortunately this year the National Construction Code has upped the standard for most states um, are adopting a seven star minimum for energy efficiency. And for the last 10 years, it's been at six stars. So it's quite a quantum leap. So that's one good thing. But we've still got 8 million houses in Australia that were built before any sort of energy efficiency uh, construction codes were brought in. And then we've got a lot of houses that were built off-grid that weren't um, approved, so that, that don't even um, stack up in, into that system. So. There's a lot of work to be done on trying to improve those houses. It's not e efficient to knock them down and start again. We want to work with what we have, with the embodied carbon and the buildings that we already have, and try and improve them. Um, and the spin-offs are uh, that you also create a more comfortable home. So in my parents' house, for example, um, the fact that we didn't have uh, windows or... Um, walls in some cases, let alone insulation or, or any of the other um, modern features, meant that the house, although we used pr practically no energy, um, was uncomfortably cold in, in winter and hot in summer. So um, it was one of the spin-offs of good thermal design of a house and also retrofitting for efficiency in terms of thermal efficiency is lower energy consumption, but also increased thermal comfort, increased health in terms of reducing condensation and, and potential for mould and so forth. Um, oh, we'll sk skip to the next slide, thank you. That's the formal opening slide from when I do a more formal presentation. Um, and this slide really is talking about what I was mentioned before, that the standards are increasing to seven stars for new buildings this year. But not only that, they're, they're improving the standards for uh, appliances as well. Um, 
So, for example, I did a, an, an energy assessment in a house in Melbourne recently and it was a very brand new build and it had all the features to, in order to pass the energy ratings. Double glazed windows, insulation in walls, ceiling, floor, everywhere. However, the builders, in their wisdom, had put in a, a one-star air conditioning system um, and it was part of my job to... to find the model of the air conditioner, look it up in the database and and then input that into the software that I use to assess houses. And it's, you know, it's criminal because, yes, the house is thermally efficient and doesn't, well, you would say it doesn't need a lot of energy except it was a ginormous house, ridiculously huge for two people, which is also the trend. Um, so, yeah, you can create a house that's thermally efficient, has a good uh, thermal shell, but if you put a very poor appliance, uh, poorly efficient appliances in that thermal shell and you don't have photovoltaics to run the energy, then you are still going to have a large carbon footprint. And you're still going to have high energy bills um, and you're not, we're not getting anywhere. The only advantage of all that thermal performance double glazing is that the house will be more resilient to extremes in temperature without needing artificial heating and cooling. But most people, especially in those colder climates, will tend to put on the heating anyway uh, and, um, and the cooling in summer. So um, what we're looking to do, or what we're chipping away at, is how do we make those 8 million plus houses more efficient so that they use less energy, have a lower carbon footprint, and also cost less in terms of, of energy costs. And it's something that a, a few talk, a speakers have spoken about today, that it's the, 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 drive, the increases in energy costs that are actually driving a lot of people to, to make changes. Um, uh, quite a few of my clients aren't motivated environmentally at all, and I have to really restrain myself. But all they want is lower energy bills. That's their solar motivation and they say to me you know well is it worth getting solar and my bill's going to be lower that's all they that's all the only reason they would want solar is lower cheaper energy bills and the only reason they would buy an efficient um, hot water system or whatever is what is the payback how quickly will it pay for itself um, and yet there's so much more to it than cost <clears throat> um, so we have, why do we do it? There's cost, there's resilience to extremes in temperature and as we know with global warming where, you know, you can anticipate, you know, hotter, hotter summers, wetter summers, extreme weather events. We need houses that can protect us from those extremes. Um, and of course, carbon emissions. So whenever I have a client that is at all interested in, in, envir in environmental issues, then I will, I will concentrate on what can we do to lower your carbon footprint. And the beauty is that it's all aligned. You lower your carbon footprint, you're going to lower your energy costs as well. Um, this slide, uh, one of our speakers this morning that's with us now from Rainbow referred to this quote. Um, and effectively it says that Yes, we want to supply our energy with renewables wherever we can. However, our first goal is to reduce our need for energy, our demand for energy. So it's what we call the demand side of, of energy. So much of the focus of governments has been on, on the supply side, so how to um, provide the energy we need to, to create stable energy grids and... Um, and even as they became more um, progressive, how do we get more renewables into that supply? And that's all fabulous. However, there's also the demand. And if we can reduce our demand, um, then we need less energy in the first place. And that's something I often say in terms of with regards to photovoltaics. Yes, um, we, we need photovoltaics and we also need to reduce demand or to, or to manage our, our energy consumption, to work in with our supply. Um, 
Yeah, we don't need to go to that slide. Yeah. I've got a whole bunch of slides that I'm not going to use that are, that are in here. We can stay on that one. Thank you. Um, yeah, so if you, if, even if you have a house that has a solid, uh, solidly sized PV system that is um, providing all of your energy needs, if you are able to reduce your consumption through techno technological means or behaviour or whatever, um, it simply frees up more energy for other uses. And some of those other uses um, other speakers have alluded to today, where as we electrify, as, as we are able to disconnect some of our gas appliances and replace them with electric appliances, we will need more electricity. And that applies to the whole grid as well as our individual homes. So, um, and particularly once, once you get an EV, your potential demand for energy, depending on what, what you consume now, could double or triple. So um, freeing up that energy by your house not being as energy hungry allows you to free up the energy to charge an EV, to uh, switch to, say, induction cooking over gas or electric hot water system instead of gas. Um, oh, we can stay back on that slide if that's OK. Um, this is one of the ones I don't, won't go through today. So, uh, and, uh, so, what was it? Hot water, um, heat cooking and, and transport. So they're gonna, you're going to need a lot of electricity if, if that's your goal, to electrify. Um, and, that's, and that's the way we're headed as we, we come further off fossil fuels. So um, I'm not going to go much further. I'm not going to go into nitty gritty today. Some of the talks I, I give to um, community groups are about, OK, what can you do about um, your hot water? What's the best type of hot water system in your house? Uh, what can you do to make your house more thermally comfortable? Even retrofitting external blinds, awnings, um, trying to keep, if you've got a hot house, how to keep the sun out of the house. So if you have a house that isn't well designed for passive solar, how do you make it better? Keep blocking the sun when you don't want the, the heat, heat load in your house and getting the sun into your house to, to warm it in the colder months. There, there are a lot of different facets to improving your home and um, reducing your, your carbon footprint. So that is about it for me. And we will... So we've got some time for questions, I think. So if the panel all sit together again, and um, I thought it was a bit cold, so. Okay, you can ask. Yes, sure. Yeah. Testing. Um, I just, just, just on that last, uh, some of that last comment was that uh, the typical electric vehicle or any vehicle in Australia does about uh, 35 kilometres on average per day, which amounts to about seven, uh, six or seven kilowatt hours. So, you know, it's not too bad. You can charge up a, a car uh, for average uh, kilometres pretty easily per day. Um, but what I wanted to mention and, and see if there's any uh, feedback on is that... Um, where people are aware that hydrogen does leak a bit from equipment, uh, it's very hard to to keep hydrogen completely in containers. Um, that's one fact. Now, um, uh, th 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 there has been a recent uh, article uh, from scientists from Princeton University and. Um, I think the article was in Nature. It was only a few weeks ago. And it, it indicated that when, if hydrogen gets used to, to a, 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 
a certain extent, which wasn't a particularly great extent, the hydrogen will 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 interact with uh, I think it was hydroxyl uh, molecules, which 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 are the, the main molecule that destroys or breaks down methane, right? So that 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 hydroxyl atom uh, uh, molecule is is important for for re for removing methane, which which is currently making half of global warming. So um, as, so the methane generally has a half-life of, I don't know, about 20 years, I think. So um, the problem is that if, if we're, we're going, well, we are heading for going to a higher hydrogen uh, economy, um, we, we have a risk because the uh, hydrogen can destroy the uh, uh, hydroxyl and the uh, methane will will have a longer uh, uh, half life, and so it's a, it's a serious risk to um, global warming. So uh, I just want to say that and see if anybody's got any feedback on it. Thank you. There's been studies done uh, way back when people were first talking about the hydrogen economy 30 years ago making the obvious comment that if, for example, you could wave a magic wand and convert the entire vehicle fleet today to hydrogen, because it's the lightest molecule and notoriously hard to confine, particularly through the sort of flexible couplings you'd need to refuel a vehicle, you would probably release tens of millions of tonnes of molecular hydrogen into the atmosphere each year. And they said an optimist might hope that the hydrogen would combine harmlessly with oxygen and form water. But he said we should do the atmospheric chemistry before we embark on the large-scale experiment because we now know, for example, that though the chlorofluorocarbons were depleting the ozone layer, we had a lucky escape because if they'd been bromofluorocarbons rather than chlorofluorocarbons, they would have totally destroyed the ozone layer. And we now know through the atmospheric chemistry that we, we had a lucky escape. And they were saying, if we're serious about the hydrogen economy and using a lot of hydrogen for uh, long distance transport, then we need to be doing the atmospheric chemistry to make sure that that's not creating another problem. The question is, why do energy companies charge a green power uh, a premium for green power when uh, solar is cheaper? Uh, the short answer is be because they can. It's like, you know, why does the dog lock he lick his testicles? Because he can. Um, if they can get away with it, they will. Um, but um, and historically, and uh, I remember when Sequeb in the 1990s invited people to pay a premium for green power. That was because at the time green power was significantly more expensive. And I was one of the people who put my hand up and paid an extra 10% to, to have green power because I thought that was, that was the right thing to do. But there's now no excuse at all for charging a premium for green power. It is actually much cheaper. And that's why um, electricity utilities without a green bone in their body are closing down coal-fired power stations uh, and nuclear power stations that have amortised their capital cost because just the running cost is more than the cost of getting electricity from solar and wind provided you've got good sites. I mean, that's the, the other point, that um, the power output of a wind turbine is proportional to the cube of the wind velocity. So if you get a 20% better wind velocity, 1.2 times 1.44 times 1.2, 1.72, so you've got about a 70% increase in power output if you get a 20% increase in the wind regime. So being the, the siting is very important for, for wind turbines. And similarly with, with solar, there are... Um, some parts, uh, like Alice Springs, where you don't get very many cloudy days at all in a year, uh, and others like Innisfail, where you get uh, several cloudy days every day. You know, that, uh <laughs> very quickly, with respect to um, solar panels at the end of their life, 
having done a lot of repurposing over the last 40 years, would you see a risk in repurposing inefficient solar panels as exterior cladding on a building, a residential scale building? Um, if it's connected in series with lots of other, if it's a working, you mean it's no, a no, working? No, just, no, just as cladding. No, I wouldn't see any risk. I mean, it will come to an end of life one day and it still does have the lead in there, but it's not, it's not getting out while it's sitting there. It gets out at end of life when the glass is broken or when it's been broken up, but it's, it's not doing any harm to anybody in the short term. Um, if you're repurposing old modules and interconnecting them and using them to generate electricity, there are concerns and, um, and regulatory problems and primarily amongst them is about electrical safety and the possibility of electrical yeah, shock I'm and insulation if they're working as... It was just the parents. basics, just to be able to use them instead so of coral I'd iron. Say, I'd say go, go for it. Okay. Just in regards of what you just said, uh, Circular Pavia Alliance and University of Queensland just uh, published a study into recycling and reusing panels. It's, if you're interested, it's very, in, uh, I think, a really, really good study. But my question is for Ian. Is there any research done into what we do to downwind weather when we take gigawatts or in further down terawatts of power out of prevailing winds? Are we going to wreck up the, the weather downwind? The, the short answer is no. I mean, the longer answer, though, is that the, the fraction of the wind energy that the wind turbine uh, harvests is very small compared with the, with the wind energy. It's the same as um, uh, the amount of solar energy that we are harvesting. Uh, even if we provided everything that humans need uh, from renewables, um, Total human energy use is about one ten thousandth of the solar energy that hits the Earth. So, um, and it's it's about one uh, five thousandth of the amount of wind energy that's there, and about one twenty thousandth of the wave power. I mean, basically, um, even if we're as wasteful as we are now, uh, getting all of our energy from natural flows hardly makes a dent in the scale of them. And that's, I mean, the the good news is that. Uh, renewable resources are orders of magnitude greater than even the most ridiculous extrapolation of human energy need. Uh, so there's no reason why we can't live on the natural flows. And the only uh, approach that is potentially sustainable into the distant future is living off the natural flows. Basically, we've, we've run down the one-off geological endowment of the fossil fuels and... Um, even if we weren't changing the climate, we'd be running out of oil and running out of gas and we would eventually have to wean ourselves off that. Uh, so basically we've been, we've been forced. Um, I agree with the American analyst Lester Milbroth who says, if civilization survives, we will look back and see global warming as uh, the wake-up call that redirected us from a, a development path that clearly wasn't sustainable onto one that could be. Thank you. Um, we're, no, we're not going to die. We're all not going to die, I can tell you that much. And we have died in the past, but we've probably forgotten about that because it's a bit of a nasty experience. Uh, the, the element that sits between uh, how you um, uh, want to use your energy, such as in a vehicle, in a house, just walking around, um, and the other element is, is over here, um, of what's available. This what's available is mostly unknown. It's obvious the sun is, is running the universe, not just the planet Earth, but is that energy. And in this unknown, there is many other things that we can't see. For instance, we didn't hear anything about geothermal. Uh, we didn't hear anything about um, gravity. <laughs> how you could use gravity. So in between these two elements is a thing called a transducer, which changes 
the, you know, and, and, and you've, you know, let's go and buy a transducer that does what we need at that time to power our car, look after our environment that we live in, our house it's called. One of the things I'd like to say about Aquarius 73 and your experience, sir, is that it was a great experience, no? It forced you into areas where you had to innovate and you lived less with less stuff like the suburban Sydney, right? Or suburban Byron Bay or suburban Nimbin as it's becoming now. Um, so we have to go to that great unknown and find these things. So we need brilliant people to be able to find these things, a bit like Madame Curie when she found the, radi ra you know, radi the, the, the radioactive abilities of, of, of certain substances. Perhaps there's an answer there too. Perhaps we shouldn't get rid of all of the nuclear systems that we've got. All right, so I'm wanting to know, any of you gentlemen here would, or anybody in the audience, can come up with that, those transducers and come up with that unseen sources of energy that can be used to run our lifestyle here as human beings. Um, I'll, leave it, I'll leave it to you. I, I can't come up with a simple solution, but to quote Amory Lovins again, there is no silver bullet, but there is silver black buckshot that... Uh, there, it's horses for courses, you know, some places have good solar energy and no wind, some have good wind and no solar energy, some have wave power. Um, I mean, the problem with wave power has always been uh, developing a device that harvests the wave energy without being destroyed by winter storms, which rearrange reinforced concrete piers. Um, but there are lots of little things. Um, for example, the town of Birdsville, recognise that the artesian bore water comes to the surface at 70 degrees and you need to allow it to cool before you can water cattle or water crops with it. So you might as well harvest that low-grade energy. And they use a Rankin engine, which was developed for a prototype solar pond in the Northern Territory, to extract energy from the heat in the artesian bore water. And birds will now get 70% of its electricity from the, the free heat in the artesian bore water. There are islands in the Pacific that recognise that the sea surface temperature is about 30 degrees and if you go down 100 metres the temperature is about 4 or 5 degrees. So you can run a heat engine between the ocean temperature, surface temperature and that down below, OTEC, Ocean Thermal Electric Conversion. Uh, if you could go forward 50 years, you won't see one technology. You'll see a whole range of technologies. Um, my personal bug is that people are putting solar panels on the roof and degrading electricity to warm water when we've known for 50 years that solar hot water is cost effective and about half the electricity consumption of a typical house is hot water. So before you put solar panels on your roof, you should buy solar hot water because that's cost effective anywhere in mainland Australia and saves half your electricity. Um, I have... Um I, I guess I'd like to correct the questioner. I think um, gravity was mentioned, but just not that word, because Ian did speak about pumped hydro, which is exactly utilising gravity for energy conversion. And the transducer, the solar cell is a transducer, of course, you know, all of these things are. And geothermal is, um, so the Birdsville example is an example of geothermal. Um, it's not big deal in Australia because it's not really hot. It's an old continent, Australia, but um, the island of Tanna, where I am, has an active volcano. We're thinking a lot about geothermal. There's lots of impediments, but um, yeah, we there, there will be that scattergun approach, that birdshot approach, and we'll do what makes sense, as Ian said, in the different places. Um, but they don't all make sense everywhere. Actually, if I, I could add, I mean, New Zealand has... Uh active volcanoes and New Zealand uses geothermal energy, the energy of uh, hot rocks and so does Iceland. So there are places where uh, geothermal energy is provided free so you might as well use it. Um, in Hawaii it flows over houses so uh, you can catch some of the heat as it goes past before it destroys your house. satellite. They're only about 100 mil square. They put out about 100 watts. 
from a, a thing that size. And I'm wondering, is that a, another technology that we don't see? Um, is it maybe a non-silicon non uh, path? And uh, maybe it's expense or something like that, but I, I'd like to know more about it because you, I, I've seen them demonstrated at a um, focal point of a parabolic reflector. I mean, you can put a lot of light on that solar cell and get an enormous output out of it, if you can cool it down with some water. Um, but we n never see or hear yeah, about it. Happy to comment. Um, yeah, so I think what you're referring to is, so the cells that are used routinely on, in, on spacecraft yeah. are much higher efficiency. I'm not sure about your numbers, but yeah, they're much higher efficiency. Um, they are usually, so in two, for two reasons. So the tandem structure that I talked about before, where we're stacking a cell on top of a cell, in those cases, they're mainly a three stack. So there's two, a, a cell and then another one on top, each accessing a different part of the solar spectrum. Um, and they're tuned for the solar spectrum outside Earth um, because it hasn't got the atmosphere absorbing some of the wavelengths. Um, they, they work better, but they're incredibly expensive. And the materials, and one of the reasons they're expensive is the materials there that are used to make the cells, or, or some of those cells, are rare. So it's hopeless to think about powering the whole Earth with those materials because, well, if you think about it in an economic way, as we use more and more of it and we consume the last bit of it, the price goes skyrocketing. And so another way of thinking about environmental, there's just not enough. <laughs> so it's not going to be happening. They do make more sense, as you allude to, in putting them in concentrators in, on Earth. Now, concentrators, they work. Um, there's, um, there's a company, a Victorian company that we, we work very closely with who's, who's working on concentrating solar um, modules, combining it with thermal outputs as well. So using that waste heat, not just cooling, but using the waste heat you get from cooling. Um, um, so the name of the company's just gone out of my head, so I'm not, I'm not hiding it, I just forgot for a second. Um, the, uh, the fundamental issue about concentration, concentrating for solar thermal or concentrating for solar photovoltaics, is you need to have clear skies. You have a sky like we have here in Nimbin today, it's pointless having a concentrator because as you concentrate, you look at less of, you access less of the sky. So if the sun is in that little bit of the sky, it's great, but if there's cloud in that little bit of the sky, it's hopeless. And this light is coming from everywhere, you've actually reduced your resource. You've got a higher efficiency conversion of a lower amount. Um, so you shouldn't be doing it. So you need to put it in places where you can have reliably clear skies. So Alice Springs is fine, but there's a limited number of customers, there's a limited number of people who live in dry, clear sky climates. People tend to live where it's cloudy. <laughs> um, and so those, those opportunities do exist, but it's not for everywhere. Richard, can I just get you to expand on the, I, I get it a lot, which is the question about rare earth minerals um, in the production of solar voltaics, or if you know anything about it in production of batteries. My understanding is it's used, uh, rare earth min minerals are used for semiconductors and for motors, but not so much actually in solar panels and lithium ba oh, batteries. Do you know any answers to that? About rare earth? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a Perhaps one of the most overused words that we've, we've got in our in our language at the moment, but because there is actually a technical meaning of rare earth, and it doesn't mean just things that come out of the ground that are rare, because there's lots of things that are rare that aren't rare earth. But that aside, um, there's one of the thing, one of the reasons that our group at UNSW has concentrated primarily on silicon solar cells, and in the 19 probably early 2000s, the US government stopped funding, funding silicon research altogether because they believed that other materials were going to be the future. They gave up on silicon and said, that's, that's the past, let's move on. Cadmium telluride came out of those research mm -hmm. programs, copper, indium, gallium, diselenide also came out. They both work, but they're not dominating the world. They're less than 5% between them. Silicon still dominates. Um, we made a really good decision there, partly because it was actually hard to change anyway, but um, we 
uh, but it was a good decision. Silicon was important because it's very abundant. We're never going to run out of yeah. silicon. Yeah. Um, the other materials, so the other alternative materials, that the, the ones we, I mentioned before for the space cells, gallium, indium, etc., quite rare. They're not technically rare earths, but they're rare minerals. Mm. Um, but there's nothing in the doping process, though, the PN junction or anything like that, so it's using rare earth, though. It's phosphorus and boron. They're yeah, not okay, wow. Well. Um, so, not for, sorry, gallium can be used as well, so mm. potentially there is, yes. Um, but phosphorus and boron can do the job. Um, that said, I, something I, I was going to mention, actually, in particular for this community, was that there's a... Um, Silicon, sil we're not going to run out of silicon, but we probably are going to run out of silver unless we change the way that we make solar cells. If we expand the solar cell market and production to the extent that we aspire to, to, to push coal and oil and gas out of the market, then we're going to have a silver supply problem. We might even have an aluminium supply problem. Um, so we're working hard on uh, replace uh, of using less silver and ideally using no silver, replacing silver. But we're not entirely there yet. I'll push a little bit further there that um, I also heard at one stage that there were lead uh, free based solder joints, but a lot of them failed in like the, the late 90s. Is that correct too? Of, uh, of lead free? I, I lead, lead free solder. It was just, yeah. sorry, it's just a backstory. So, so there was a lead, there was a there was a ban in Europe on lead, on lead in electronics. Mm. And there was, um, there was um, a request to exempt solar from that ban. So while that ban was there, there was a lot of pressure on getting the lead out. Mm. It can be done, but we, it, the technology exists. Um, but it's not cheaper. Um, it's different temperatures are used for, and there's consequences that come from that term in the manufacturing. So there's, it's, lead is preferred, the lead solder is preferred in lots of ways, um, but it's not the environmentally best thing so, or for the toxicity. Um, some companies, REC, for example, manufacturers in Singapore, Norwegian companies, they, they make a lead-free module, which is important to Australia, but you pay a bit more for it. Yeah. <laughs> so, Thank you. Can I add a comment? I've been reviewing abstracts for the World Mining Congress, which is going to happen in Brisbane next month. And uh, there are papers being given there that basically say um, there is no uh, technical solution to providing for everyone on Earth to use energy at the rate that countries like Australia do now. Uh, that you know, if you assume everyone's using solar cells with batteries, there's not enough lithium. Uh, whatever solution you come up with, um, you run into problems producing enough of the materials that are needed for that conversion and that storage. And the only uh, answers that make any sense are one in which we dramatically reduce the demand for resources per person. Uh, and in the final analysis, um, those of us who are now living high off the resource hog have to live more simply so that others can simply live. I haven't heard any of you gentlemen speak about the electromagnetic energy that surrounds the whole planet. From what little I know, and it is really nothing, uh, Nikolai Tesla seemed to have a bit of an understanding on this. Have you seen anything or anything? I mean, basically, it's going to be free energy if, if, if it's possible to tap into it. Um, and I know a big business wouldn't like that. So in your research and in your understanding and your expertise, have you come across anything like that? Well, I haven't. I mean, there, there is an Earth's magnetic field and it's capable of moving the, the needle on a compass, but uh, I don't think the, the energies, the, the quantity of the energy there is, is harnessable in any realistic way. But uh, Richard's a physicist. You may be able to uh, enlighten me. Actually, technically, I thought you were a physicist. I'm an electronic engineer. But, uh, um, no, I don't think I can enlighten, but I, I, yeah, I, 
I don't think it's a plot. Um, I think we do, if there's something there, we don't know, um, as far as to my knowledge anyway. But maybe there's something we're missing, and I hope it's true, and it'll save our bacon. But um, I'm a vegetarian too, so sorry for that. But, uh, <laughs> I, not that I know of. I like the story that somebody stayed up all night trying to work out where the next energy source would come from, and then it dawned on him. <laughs> Could I ask a question? I've heard that, the, and I came late to your talk, so I may have missed it, but that the drawbacks in, in terms of using solar and for electricity industrially are, are found in the problems of being able to uh, store enough energy, that the battery systems are really the limiting factors in terms of the resources needed to provide a steady source of solar when the sun isn't out, basically. And, or either, either at the individual house level or at the regional level through the grid, do you not need batteries, the ability, well, you were talking about pumped uh, hydro, but that's not available everywhere either. So the, one of the arguments about solar has to do with the availability of the minerals this, the resources that would be needed to provide the battery storage that such a, such a system will need. By the way, I'm in favor. <laughs> Just. Uh, as I understand the question, it's you know, whether we can have storage on a scale big enough to allow us. And um, it's very hard to see uh, enough batteries being constructed, but it's much easier to see how pumped hydro could do it and the figures I've seen on comparative cost, uh, pumped hydro storage with good sites is significantly less expensive per unit of delivered energy than batteries. Um, and uh, I mentioned in my talk that um, there was a study done by three scientists at the Australian National University, Ken Ball and Malcolm Stock and Andrew Blakers, that uh, argued you would only need to use the 50 best of the 15,000 sites they identified around the grid in Australia to have enough storage to run Australia totally on solar and wind. Uh, now, even if they're out by a factor of two or three. Um, the, and the interesting thing, uh, when I say that, people always say, well, what about the water? We're a dry continent. The total amount of water you would need is 0.1% of the amount we now use for irrigation. Um, and uh, I'll be talking tomorrow about environmental problems, but we obviously should be using a lot less water for irrigation because the state of our inland rivers, particularly the Murray-Darling system, is a result of taking more water out of those rivers than is consistent with maintaining the ecological systems. So uh, I think that if, if I could go through a, a sort of time warp and land in 2050, uh, I think we will probably have a network of pumped hydro storage systems um, and there's one being uh, prototyped in North Queensland now. The old Kidston Gold Mine has two pits which are uh, at separate heights. Um, so they've commissioned a pumped hydro scheme to pump water from one pit to the other. Uh, in that case, they don't have to do any construction. The, uh, the big holes have been left there by the mining companies. And all you have to do is pump the water uphill when you've got extra solar energy and allow it to run down when you need it. So I don't think we'll... Have, uh, we might have batteries at the sort of community level. I think they make more sense than at the household level because uh, it, it's hard to justify the economics of you having enough storage to run your house totally from a battery. But if it's a network of 100 houses, you're not all using your energy at the same time, so you don't need 100 times as much storage. So I think community battery storage makes more sense than individual but on the figures I've seen, pumped hydro wins by about a factor of two over battery storage in, just in cost and by a factor of hundreds in terms of resources. And uh, that's the, the, the problem. I remember um, doing a back of the envelope sum, uh, what would happen if we converted the entire vehicle fleet to electric cars when we were using lead acid batteries and the amount of lead you need was more than the known amount of lead uh, in the world, so that, that just didn't make sense. And I think you know, the, the reason pumped hydro will probably prevail over batteries is just the, 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 you don't need the, the minerals that you would need to have 
enough batteries to store enough electricity to run the world. Just a quick follow-up. Could you comment on the environmental impact of that pump storage? I know in my where I come from along the Hudson River, there was a plan to use the local mountain to create a reservoir at the top for pumped hydro, and that was that was stopped by by environmental lists. Uh, well, the, re the reason some of us uh, went to a lot of trouble to stop a hydroelectric scheme in Tasmania is recognising that uh, hydroelectric schemes based on impoundment have very significant environmental impacts. And we now know, for example, that taking 96% of the water out of the Snowy River for the Snowy Mountains Hydro Scheme, which has been providing 10% of the electricity of the entire eastern states for 50 years, has had a, a dramatic effect on the ecology of the Snowy River. Um, so if you were doing an environmental impact now, you probably wouldn't approve the Snowy Mountain Scheme. Uh, so I think uh, run of the river hydro is much more defensible than impoundments, which flood vegetation and, and damage the, the natural flows in the river. And pumped hydro schemes are usually uh, designed so that they're not having a bad ecological impact. But it, it goes back to the point, because there is no environmentally benign way of producing or storing energy, any project should be subject to a proper environmental impact assessment to ensure that uh, you're not doing more harm than good. And just as it's possible to put a wind turbine over a migratory path and kill birds, uh, it's possible to design a pumped hydro scheme so that it does environmental damage, that uh, every project should be assessed on its merits. Uh, what about oh, just, uh, what about uh, CO2 and, and uh, methane emissions from dams, especially up further north? Methane emissions from dams, yes. Uh, I remember when there was a proposal for the so-called Tully Millstream hydroelectric project. The Queensland Electricity Commission was going to dam the Tully River and uh, build a dam to produce hydroelectricity. And I did a calculation and showed that the amount of tropical rainforest that was going to be flooded uh, and then anaerobically decomposed uh, meant that uh, the greenhouse impact of Tully Millstream would have been worse than burning coal. And the then Electricity Commissioner said, yes, Professor Lowe is right, we should burn the rainforest before we uh, build the dam <laughs> so that we don't emit methane. Uh, and again, the, the answer is that every project has to be assessed and it's entirely possible, uh, in fact, a lot of old impoundments uh, did probably do more harm than good because they flooded uh, vegetation which then decomposed anaerobically. And uh, we'll probably look back and think that a lot of um, urban waste tips are probably doing a lot of harm because organic material has been dropped there, it is decomposing anaerobically and unless it's properly sealed, that's going out into the atmosphere as methane, which in the short term is a 20 times worse greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Uh, 